Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we're joined by the distinguished Dr. Matthew Smith. Dr. Smith is an associate professor in the Department of Plant Pathology at the University of Florida and the curator of the UF Fungal Herbarium. He teaches the UF Mycology course and takes on the responsibility of identifying unknown fungi for a variety of Florida stakeholders, including the UF Plant Disease Clinic, UF IFAS Extension Service, and the UF Veterinary School. His broad range of interests when it comes to fungi spans fungal ecology, evolution, and systematics. Dr. Smith has worked extensively on the biology and systematics of hypogeus fungi, or truffles, and the ecology of plant symbiotic ectomycorrhizal fungi. However, he's also studied a variety of other fungal groups, including plant pathogens, Armillaria malia, or honey mushrooms, and Claviceps purpurea, or ergot, as well as the nematode-destroying fungi. Dr. Smith's work combines the synergistic use of molecular, morphological, and culture-based methods in both the laboratory and in field settings. I'm excited to learn more about his perspectives on kingdom fungi and to learn more about the mysterious enigmatic truffle fungi. Matthew, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it is an absolute honor to have you having dove deep into your work. There's loads and loads and loads of interesting information. And as often happens in the mycology community, there's been overlap with other great guests I've had on, like Professor Henkel at Humboldt. It was affirming to see it as a small world and you're kind of connected. with. <laughs> it's definitely a small world. Mycology is a small world. Absolutely. Well, before we get into all your amazing research, I've got a million questions listed here. You know, what got you into kingdom fungi? What were some of those early influences, some of the sequence of synchronistic events that led you to be obsessed with fungi and mushrooms? That's a great question. Well, I grew up in California. I grew up in Sonoma County. And so I did a lot of hiking when I was young. I really enjoyed being out in the woods. It was a great place to grow up because there was a lot of nature right nearby where I lived. So that definitely inspired me um, when I was young. And I was always interested in biodiversity. And when I went to college, I went to UC Davis, which is a really good school for biology. So I took a lot of great courses in biology. And I knew I was interested in fungi. I'd seen them in the woods. And I, I was always curious about them. But what really got me hooked was when I took a course in mycology as an undergraduate at mm. UC Davis. And I took the course with the person who went on to be my PhD advisor, Dave Rizzo, who's a professor at UC Davis and was a great influence on me. But probably the most exciting thing about that course was just having so many questions that we only got partial answers to because there were no answers. So the sheer diversity of fungi was really exciting. But then also just realizing how much there was still to know about fungi, I got really excited about that. And it's part of why I remain so excited about studying fungi is just there's so much to know and there's so much we don't know. And that's really fun. Yeah. A lot of people talk about the world seems so well defined at this point, you know, where we are with certain sciences and technology. It seems like, man, everything's been discovered. There's no room yeah. for the explorer or the origin unless you get out, you know, go out into space at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, so oh, think- yeah. Well, I would say with fungi, the age of exploration is right now. I mean, we're, yeah. we are definitely, you know, with, with botany, I always compare mycology with botany because they have some similarities and they used to be considered together. And, you know, there was a time when it was like that for plants. We would go to a new place and it was like, wow, there's all these new plants. What are they? But we're still in that phase for fungi. And there's literally new species that you can find in your backyard. Um, yeah. and that's pretty exciting. And the other thing is, I think that, you know, like you say, in biology, a lot of times you go to take a biology class as an undergraduate and you get this giant book that says biology. And it's like 600 pages. And you're like, oh, it's it's all known, right? Like everything right. is known. Why am I here? I'm just here to cram as much information as possible into my head. And then when you get to a class like fungal biology, you recognize that the natural world, there's so much still to know. So that's just very inspirational for me. Yeah, well, and you grew up in such an amazing area for hunting mushrooms and being involved 
with mushrooms in mycology. Uh, I'm actually in Marin County, so we go up to Sonoma pretty frequently. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, then you keep going further north. So just yeah, not Northern surprised. Northern California is good. Northern California has so much open space and public land for going out to look for fungi. It's really great for that. Yeah, so I'm not surprised that you came from Sonoma County. It all started to make sense. You know, you started this path in exploring mushrooms. How did you find yourself uh, in Florida? Well, if you take the academic route for studying fungi, it's often there's chance things that happen and you and you end up in a place that you didn't necessarily expect to, to end up. University of Florida is sort of like UC Davis, where it's a big campus with a lot of sciences and a lot of biology. And mm. so at a point in my career where I was looking for an appropriate academic job, they posted a position and I applied and, and I think I was a good fit. So it's been a great place to work. It's very different from California in many ways, but it's also excellent for fungi. It's an amazing place to live. And we have a lot of native habitats right nearby where you can go out and look for fungi. So I would imagine Florida has a pretty unique populations of fungi there. Yeah, Florida is interesting because it's definitely the south part of Florida is definitely fully tropical. Right. And then the north part is definitely not tropical and you have a gradient <laughs> in between. And for someone who's really interested in ectomycorrhizal fungi, it's a great place because a lot of the natural habitats are dominated by pines and oaks and other okay. mycorrhizal plants. So there's just an amazing abundance and diversity of boletes and ammonitas and rushulas and other ectomycorrhizal fungi. Florida has stuck out to me as a place I need to go and explore the fungi because anytime you get some of those kind of blending between tropical to neotropical to almost more, you know, northern Florida, almost temperate, you get some really interesting flow of genetics and flow of, of fungi. But then, you know, amidst all these amazing fruit bodies that you're finding, all these UCM fungi, how did you go underground and get obsessed with truffles? Because, ah, you know, your name, when, when I saw your email, it's Truffle Smith. You are not shy about your love of truffles. So how did that come about? Well, you know, when your name is Matthew Smith, if you go to try to make an email address, it's, it's, <laughs> kind, of, it's kind of rough. It reminds you of how boring your name can be. So, so adding truffle smith was more exciting. That was yeah. how that, that came about. But truffles, I got really interested in truffles partly because in California, where there's a Mediterranean climate, mm. a lot of the soils are clay or their high soil pH, so their basic soils, um, in those environments, that is the perfect environment for, for truffles. So the oak woodlands of California are just spectacularly filled with truffles that you don't see unless you're going out just looking for them specifically. And I should say not all of them are edible, only a very small fraction of those truffles are edible. Right. But if you're interested in biodiversity, it's it's very high biodiversity of truffle-like fungi. And that seems to be the case also in other places where you have a sort of a Mediterranean climate where you have cool, wet winters and hot, dry summers and places that have a lot of ectomycorrhizal plants and they have a lot of wildfire. Those places always seem to have a lot of truffle-like fungi. Ah, and then what are some of the defining features of truffle? Because kind of a, I know a lot of fungal groupings don't have static boundaries as we like to think about it, but truffles, especially, you know, people talk about truffle like sclerotia and truffle like fungus. So what are the, some of the defining features of the true truffle as, as we know it? So I define truffles very broadly. So any okay. fungi that fruit below the ground and they're making their spores inside of an enclosed fruiting body, I would call that a truffle. Okay. in the broad sense. The oftentimes when people are talking about truffles, they're really referring specifically to the edible truffles in the genus Tuber. So traditionally those are, there are several really important, economically important species, right. especially in Europe and now are cultivated in other places. So those would many times when people are talking about truffles, they're talking about truffles in a very strict sense for certain species of Tuber. I'm usually talking about truffles in a much broader definition where you've had convergent evolution from a bunch of different groups of fungi have evolved this similar, morphologically similar structure, which is just a coating on the outside of tissue. And then the inside is more or less all spores. The idea, right, is that these don't shoot their spores off. The spores are encased inside of that truffle. So quite often we think that those 
those truffles are consumed by different animals and then the animals are dispersing those spores through their fecal material right sure. and many but not all of those are also ectomycorrhizal fungi and so when you have a fecal pellet that gets deposited and it's filled with spores that it's right at a good spot where it, those spores can germinate and associate with that plant that's right nearby that's what we think is often happening it's probably not happening 100 percent of the time there are certainly some truffle-like fungi that are saprotrophic so they're getting their energy from decaying plant matter or something like that. Right. But I would say the majority of them are ectomycorrhizal. And as part of this reproductive strategy, is that pungent aroma a key defining factor as well to make sure you're attracting in those animals? Yes, and so part of why we really like certain species of tubers, that they really have an odor that we happen to really think is amazing and we like to shave them on eggs and pasta and right. everybody gets really excited about those. Some of the other ones that you will find that have really, really strong odors, they can be really, really strong, but in a bad way. So there are some, there's one Alaphomyces species here in Florida that is very, very strong and it smells like fishy, like kind of a little bit rotted fish, maybe not all the way rotted, but just a little off fish smell. Uh. There's one in Cal one or two in California that have a very strong smell. There's one that smells like you left a, a container of milk on the counter for like a week. Ooh. So really curdly milk smell. So there's all different kinds. And the thing is, all you need is the right animal to like that smell and come and dig you up and eat you. It doesn't matter if the humans think that it smells like curdled milk. If their spores are dispersed, <laughs> then it's then it's perfect, right? Yeah, absolutely. And if you know this, just from kind of an evolutionary biology perspective, do we have any idea of how old this reproductive strategy is? You know, when you compare, I know rough comparisons of like gills to ridges on fruit bodies ridges are thought to be a more ancient type of or an older type of reproductive system than eventually branched off into gills where does the truffle fall on that spectrum is this a very very old style or a newer or do we not know so, so i would say all of the above okay. because they're so different from each other there's so many different groups that form these kind of fruiting bodies yeah there's evidence to suggest that some of them have been doing that strategy for a very long time. Mm. And then others are evolving all the time. So there's yeah. some other ones where they're very closely related with a mushroom, for example, where you can see a morphological similarity between the truffle and the mushroom. Wow. But it, so we infer that in that in some of those cases, it's a very recent event that's led to them becoming truffle-like. So we also know, or we infer anyways, that we only need a loss of function mutation or maybe several loss of function mutations to go from a quote unquote complicated fruiting structure like a mushroom yeah. to a truffle, which is just, there's fewer tissues involved. You're just sort of making a ball of spores basically. Right. And so because you could just have some chance mutations happen and then become a truffle, and then that truffle can either be successful or not, right? You can imagine a scenario where a fungus becomes a truffle and then for whatever reason, it doesn't smell very good or it's not in the right habitat. It doesn't, it doesn't make it. Yeah. But if that keeps happening over and over and over, that in some cases it's going to be highly successful. And so in some cases like the, the tuber, the genus tuber, which there's lots and lots of species and they're all over the Northern hemisphere, we sort of infer that it was pretty successful. <laughs> right. And some of those could have actually come from mushrooms having a chance mutation and evolving into just that ball of spore. That's interesting to think about. Yeah. And so, and it's also interesting that you have that happening. So in the case of tuber, the closest relatives are cup fungi. Okay. Um, yeah. Whereas in the basidiomycetes, you have things that are very closely related with mushrooms or, you know, sort of classic mushrooms. So you have these kind of occurring in a bunch of different groups. Of fungi so truffles are... can be both ascomycetes and some are basidiomycetes. Is that that's right? Wow. And actually, there are some. So and endogenales are actually what we would consider zygomycetes. They're in the mucoromycota now, is the group that we would consider them in. But these are zygomycete fungi. I have never heard of that, and I was reading on your website about your exploration into zygomycetes, and it sounded like that was enough for you know a whole other podcast. <laughs> but just briefly. What are these ancient zygomycetes? Just because I thought it was so interesting. We all think of ascomycetes, 
and that can range from so many different things, but like yeasts and morels, I think people are pretty familiar with that. The basidiomycetes. Yeah, many of the lichens are in the ascomycetes. And then the basidiomycetes, which are the big fruiting bodies, all of it to know and love. But what are what are zygomycetes? And I guess, how did you get interested in those? Just to um, take us down a little rabbit hole. Yeah, it's a little bit of a rabbit hole because many people who are interested in mushroom hunting, you won't see zygomycetes as much. But they are all around us. So, so in the broad sense, our buscular mycorrhizal fungi belong in the zygomycetes. The bread molds, some molds that you would see in your house, like uh, rhizopus and eucor. There are some things that are around that people will be familiar with that are zygomycetes, but most yeah. of the zygomycetes are are totally microscopic, and okay. so people get less excited about them. But <laughs> okay. they're they're very interesting because you know when fungi emerged out onto land, they had to do all kinds of amazing new things that they didn't have to do before. Right? You had to deal with UV light. You had to deal with gravity. And there was really not soil at that time. There was a lot of things going on. And we infer that those first fungi that emerged and became terrestrial, those are basically the zygomycetes sort of emerged out of those. They're the first filamentous fungi. And so we know that actually a lot of those, they're parasitic on very small animals that you can't culture them. They're like on, on nematodes or on amoebas in water. So there's all these fungi that we really don't, study that much because they don't have a big economic impact. The reason that I've been interested in them is to try to understand the evolution of fungi at the broadest scale. You really yeah. have to look at some of these otter members of the kingdom fungi that don't get as much attention. And it just gets at that very core theme about fungi, which is they are ubiquitous. So if they we go ubiquitous. down to the microscopic world, then we get into this whole new family of zygomycetes that are just everywhere that are just gets to the fact that fungi are like this glue of every biotic system in so many ways. But interesting to know that truffles can fall into any of these categories. Yes. So in the broadest sense, in the broadest sense, pretty broad definition. That, yeah. yeah. Anything that makes their fruiting bodies in these little balls of spores that are underground, I would consider them truffles. So just as some highlights from your own research, what are some of the questions that you've looked at uh, surrounding truffles? Well, initially, I was really interested in ectomycorrhizal fungi, and that's how I got into truffles in the first place. So yeah. I've done sort of systematics studies on a lot of fungi just that are truffle-like, just to figure out what they're related to. Because in many cases, when you look at them under the microscope, you can't really tell what they're related to because they look so different morphologically from their closer their close relatives. Okay. So for example, you find a truffle and you dig it up and it smells really nice and it looks really interesting, but you can't look at it and right away tell what it's related to. Then you might look at the spores and you might say, well, it could be related to this group or it could be related to that group. But to really be sure, you have to sequence DNA and compare the DNA from that truffle to whatever other DNA sequences are available. Right. Well, that can tell you something about how often they evolve and in which groups they evolve. And I would say a lot of that information has become available since I took mycology. You know, when I first took mycology, <laughs> we were still really unclear about the, the tree of life for fungi. And so I would say piece by piece, I'm really interested in helping to build that tree of life and add as many truffles onto the tree of life as possible on the way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of us have heard of the European truffles, you know, the white truffle, the black truffle, the ones that are so famous when you think of truffle hunters over in Italy following around their special breed of dogs, right. digging in the ground looking for truffles. But are there truffles native to the U.S. and even endemic to uh, North America? There are. So there are a number, um, and I would say they're increasingly being commercialized. The most okay. famous ones that people will know probably the best are the Oregon white truffle and the Oregon black truffle, those are right. widely commercialized now. So the, the white truffles are, are all tuber species. The Oregon black truffle is actually not a tuber. It's in the genus Leucangium. So it's uh -huh. more closely related to morels than it is to tubers. And what's interesting is that's a good example where there's still some debate about actually how that truffle gets its energy. It's thought to be ectomycorrhizal, but there's a lot that we really don't know about that particular species, but it's already commercialized and it's very tasty. 
Yeah. And it's and it's widely sold, but there's still a lot we don't know about the biology of that particular truffle group because the the closest relatives don't form ectomycorrhizae. So it's interesting because it's either that it's evolved the ability to form ectomycorrhizae, which is totally possible. That's evolved a lot of different times. We know that. Or it's getting its energy from somewhere else and, we, and we're not sure. There's other ones as well. So it, here in the southeastern United States, we're studying the pecan truffle, which is the tuber leonii group. And I know people probably might have heard of that species. It's less it's been less frequently commercialized than the Oregon truffles, but people are interested in trying to cultivate it. And it, it occurs naturally throughout the Southeast on under oak trees and also especially under pecan trees. These are two different groups of ectomycorrhizal trees that are pretty common. Pecans are also known as the hickory. So there's a lot of native hickories. When you have, a, when you have it in the forest, people call it a hickory. The pecan is just one hickory species that people have cultivated on purpose for the nuts, but there are a number of other species that are out in the woods as well. I did not know that about hickories and pecan trees. That's That alone is fascinating, but I read about that pecan truffle in your work and just something about that sounds amazing, having a pecan farm full of these truffles. And I guess when it comes to commercialization, how easy or how difficult is that because you know here in northern california i'm sure as you're familiar with people try you know i've had friends who have bought oaks that are supposedly pre-inoculated with truffle things right. of that nature and then i know you go up to oregon and they do have people starting truffle farms so yes. how easy is it to commercialize these things well i think it's getting easier all the time to okay. grow truffles but you know you have i think it helps to think about what a truffle is and what you're doing if you the process of cultivating truffles is really different than say cultivating an orchard for pecans so if you're yeah. if you're cultivating an orchard for pecans right you have to get your soil just right you get the right variety you plant your pecans then you wait 10 years <laughs> or whatever eight years before your pecans start to produce and then you can see the pecans as they're developing you can see the tree and you're going to do all the things you need to do in this very well-studied tree to get it to produce as many pecans as possible, right? And you okay. can see it the whole time. And yeah. you can see it the whole time. And if you have a pest, let's say you have some animal that's coming in and eating your pecans, you know because you can see that and you could do some sort of mitigation to stop that from happening. Right. But when you're growing truffles, you're actually growing a tree and then trying to optimize the conditions to grow the fungus and then trying to get that fungus to fruit. And in many cases, we don't totally understand all of the processes that, that, because there are cases where we know from studies that you have good colonization from the fungus on the tree, but it's not producing fruiting bodies, truffles, right? right? And we don't know exactly why. So there's a lot more complexity. You're basically farming a symbiosis, right? You're yeah. farming a tree, but you're also, farming the truffle and you have to get them to cooperate and you have to also get the environment just right for fruiting. Yeah, there's a lot of steps there and I would say there's a lot we don't know. The other thing that's important to know is that you're basically trying to take over a symbiosis that normally if you went out into a, a forest, oak forest, right, that tuber species would be one of many, many species of actomycorrhizal fungi, maybe right. hundreds, right? Right. And you're basically trying to get just one to grow and produce a lot of truffles for you. So it's, it's complicated. And I think that part of why it's so interesting is there's so much that we don't know, but it also is part of why it makes it challenging to get it to work all the time. Well, and for any of us mushroom hunters or foragers, we've often thought, why can't I cultivate just ECM or ectomycorrhizal fungi in general. And that's what stood out to me so much about people being able or having success cultivating truffles is I know, you know, how absolutely difficult. I mean, having spoke with a number of folks who are very deep in the research of ECM fungi, like Professor Bruns, he says, you can't do it. We just don't know why things fruit where they do. We don't know why they take where they do. And you've actually added another dimension where you wonder if it's something about the competitive environment, maybe other compounds being secreted into the soil by other mycorrhizal fungi. Right. Uh, so there's well, just a million variables. Yeah, certainly competition must have something to do with it. And we have some evidence that that's the case, that competition is at least part of the story. 
Yeah. I mean, where people have been successful growing truffles, they're taking advantage of certain tuber species that are adapted to disturbance. Mm. So I will say many truffles, right? They they actually don't mind a certain amount of disturbed environment um, because okay. they're adapted to have that animal eat them. And then the animal defecates sort of at the edge of the canopy, perhaps, where there's actively growing roots and probably in an environment where animals are digging. So animals are digging for the truffle. It's disturbing the soil. So if that's your jam, if that's your lifestyle, <laughs> right. then you're okay with a certain amount of disturbance. And the other thing we know is that that group of fungi that the true truffles belong to, which is the order P. zizales, many of the fungi in that group, they seem to really like high soil pH, so basic soil. And so you can actually make the soil more basic and less acidic, and that actually helps to select for those fungi. You've probably heard that people use lime when yeah. they're trying to grow truffles, right? They'll come in, they'll plow up an area, and they'll dump just tons and tons of lime, and then right. they'll grow trees that grow well in a high pH soil. That's sort of a, bio you can think of it as a biotic filter, so that any spores of ectomycorrhizal fungi that might happen to land there, only some subset of them are going to be okay with that high soil pH. So it's kind of makes it like an island where that truffle does really well. And we know that many of the truffles do really well and in this island of high soil pH. And yeah. that probably excludes a lot of things that don't do well in that kind of environment. So that reduces the competition. And it begs the question from someone like yourself, who is such a so knowledgeable about truffles. When are we going to see the Dr. Smith truffle farm? Ah. <laughs> well, you know, currently I have two teenagers and we have seven PhD students associated with the lab. So maybe when that's not so busy, I'll, <laughs> I'll take on truffle farming too. Um, I do, I am really interested in trying to cultivate tuber leonii in, in particular on pecans because it's yeah. something that I think has economic potential sure and especially for the southeast where you know there's definitely some some areas of the southeast where you can grow pecans very successfully so you have very large acreage of pecans and so that could be an economic boost to some of those yeah. communities. so i think it, i think it has potential little by little i've been i've been working on that system with some of my graduate students and some of my collaborators it's two really good collaborators that i've worked on that system with for a long time, Tim Brenneman, who is a professor at University of Georgia, and Greg Benito, who is an expert on truffles, who's from Michigan State University. Uh, so okay. we've been collaborating and we hope to continue to collaborate on that. But it, it takes a lot of time. Like I said, when you grow truffles, you know, you got to let the tree get to a certain size as the host plant before you're ever going to see a fungal individual associated with that tree that could be big enough to produce truffles. So the fastest people ever usually get production of truffles is usually like eight years or so. I mean, I know I've heard cases of less time, but for the most part, you basically have to set it up and treat it nicely and then wait for quite a long time to see if it's going to work. That's yeah. another one of the challenges of, of growing truffles. Yeah, I mean, you're nurturing a symbiosis that is on a completely different time scale uh, than we are. The players involved they are much more long lived. <laughs> But I always have that question about, you know, this knowledge of ECM fungi in particular uh, and arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi that we're gaining is what is that applied element? And having talked, spoken with a number of academics, you know, that might be jumping the gun a little. We still have so much to know. It's hard to know how to apply it. But I am always really inspired by that idea, like you were just saying, of inoculating pecan groves or using some of these species to inoculate existing habitats and just having that bonus of mushrooms being introduced in the system, fungi being introduced in the system. Do you think that's kind of the, the leading edge of any applied use of mycorrhizal fungi, including truffles? Or do you see some other avenue where learning more about them could be, could be applied somewhere? No, I, I mean, I definitely think inoculating in certain scenarios where it's more likely to work. There's some scenarios where it's definitely more likely to be successful. So for example, in a pecan grove, you already have this built-in sort of environment that already, we know that it works well for the troubles because they show up on accident. Yeah, you know, where they, we didn't they like it very clearly. And then you go into a pecan grove and you just find a bunch of truffles. No one did anything on purpose to get those truffles there. 
but it's so it kind of tells you that well at least in theory if you get the conditions right you can recreate that so i would say that's a, a situation where they're already liming the soil because pecans need a certain ph for good production Perfect. they have like a ph range that they do well in so a lot of times they're already adding soil amendments and they're also doing disturbance just the right amount of disturbance in some cases as part of the harvest of the pecans they usually use big tractors that are sweeping off all the leaf litter and then they shake the trees and then they go and collect the nuts and so that process seems to be at least tolerated by the truffle maybe not better for the truffle but at least tolerated by the truffle so i think the pecan groves are a good example another place where i think it could work uh, well is in places where they're growing pines for example outside of the native range okay. where you have a relatively small community of fungi that's been introduced on accident with the pines that you could probably manipulate that because it's a highly manipulated environment anyways it's not a natural forest so these simplified forest like environments are probably the ones that will be able to manipulate most readily and certainly being outside of the native range of the plant and the fungus helps. So where people have started to grow truffles in Australia, for example, where you're taking um, oak and hazel trees well outside of their native range and you're planting them in isolation. So the other fungi that they might naturally compete with or that might parasitize the truffle, or you might have insects that would eat truffles, those things aren't there. And so certainly Australia is, is on track to be the number one producer of tuber melanosporum. Right now, they're they're on a trajectory for that. Wow. And we expect they will become, if they're not already, the world's largest producer as a nation for tuber melanosporum, which is the European black truffle. That's incredible. And it begs the question, have you ever gone out into the wild to ever go truffle hunting, been to Europe, or maybe truffle hunting in some pecan groves? So I've, I have been to Spain and I did get to see truffle dogs at work once, wow. uh, but I have not spent enough time in Europe, sadly. I have spent a lot more time looking for truffles in North America, and I have had a chance to go out with a truffle dog, and that is an amazing, you should definitely, if you get a chance to go see a, a really good truffle dog at work, it is spectacular to see. I mean, I got a chance to go out with a truffle dog and we did sort of a little experiment where we had several truffle hunters going sort of in one orchard. And then in the next door orchard, we sent out a guy and his truffle dog. And then we came back after a little while to see who did well and who did not do well. And we were just blown completely out of the water. It was like people looking for truffles is very inefficient compared to going with a dog. They're, they're amazing. They have amazing abilities to find truffles. There's a reason that they go through all that work to train those dogs and we'll pay lots of money for just the right breed because it's spectacular to watch and they're very efficient. Yeah, that's definitely a dream mushroom hunting scenario is going out with a truffle dog and finding the elusive truffle. And you've talked about the economic significance. This may not be something you know, but you know, I've seen different numbers thrown around, but generally do you have a sense of kind of what the average size of a truffle might be and how valuable that would be? I can just tell you that the value is highly dependent on the species of truffle. Okay. And it's also obviously the, the shape and size because it is influenced by humans, that humans grade the truffles and decide which ones are the nicest looking ones, which ones meet certain criteria. So when they sell truffles, they have a process. And there's usually for the highest end truffles for tuber magnatum, which is definitely the highest value truffle. There's a lot of grading that goes into that. Certainly very, very large intact truffles are in the many hundreds of dollars an ounce because there are, it's supply and demand. People love truffles and especially for species like tuber magnatum, which have not been successfully grown outside of their natural habitat. They're very rare and they're very special. And so people are willing to pay a very high you know, high dollar value for those products. So tuber melanosporum and tuber estivum are two pretty high value ones, but they have been cultivated. So that has changed the market a little bit because when you cultivate it, right, the demand might be high, but also the supply is much higher. So it's, 
the economics of truffles is complicated. And it's definitely outside of my range of expertise. Sure, sure. And it may be an even more flux if more of these Australian truffle farms come online. It may cause a, a shudder through the entire truffle economic system, if you will. Uh, but see, they're in the Southern Hemisphere. So this is the other complicated part is if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you're producing a winter truffle in our summer. So that also makes things very complicated as well. It's like for some places, especially in Europe, there's often uh, a time of year when you would go out to look for certain truffles. Right. And so you don't necessarily want that truffle in six months off the time when you're supposed to be finding it. So in terms of how those things will be distributed and consumed around the world, yeah, that's definitely outside of my area, but it, but it is interesting and it's changing a lot all the time. Yeah, my imagination can't help but run away with me with that one. So thank <laughs> you other, for going, I, since going we're talking about Yeah, since we're talking about native truffle species, yeah. I have to say that there is one species called Tuber canuliculatum, which doesn't seem to be very abundant in any one place, but has a very wide range throughout, ranges more or less from North Carolina to Quebec, and then west to Michigan. So quite a large wow, that's huge. in the east. Like I said, it doesn't seem to be super abundant in any one spot, but I have to say that's also one of my favorite truffles. It's there's a little debate about what's the correct common name. I have heard it called the Appalachian truffle because it loosely follows the Appalachian mountain chain, although it, it deviates from it somewhat. But I think that's one that over time you're going to see a lot more interest in because I know at least two people who are working on cultivating that truffle. And I do think it has great potential as a as an edible that if you could if you could make it successful, it also is quite tasty and and because it has, it's found over a very wide range of habitats and right. with a bunch of different host plants, I think it has really good potential as a cultivated edible if people can get it to work. So we'll see. That's one you should look for on your on your decades long time a schedule that you were talking about. That one may show up on some on some tables. Yeah, we're we're definitely marking that one on the wish list. The Appalachian <laughs> truffle, and because we're talking about foraging, are there any indications of the presence of truffle populations in an area with trees, you know, we're talking about, obviously it's underground, it's largely unseen. The smell is kind of the big giveaway for animals. Are there any visual signs when you go into a grove of maybe pecan trees or oak trees that there may be truffles present? Because I've heard rumors in the foraging community of, oh, you'll see a circle of dead grass at the base of the tree, but is there any real visual sign that they're present? So the, the circle of dead grass comes from the Tuber melanosporum, which is the European black truffle that's cultivated. Okay. So it is actually known to have what they, they call it a brulee, which is a burn, you know, the translation is burn, okay. where you find this sort of area where the there's scorched grasses and forbs and other herbaceous plants around the base of a tree. And actually recently it's been shown that those scorched grasses and other things, they actually within their roots have endophytic mycelium from tuber melanosporum. It's unclear exactly how it functions, whether the fungus is taking energy from those plants that it's colonizing. Is it actively killing them? What, what's the process? We still don't totally understand that, huh. but it's an area of active research. I know there are several people working on that in Europe. And so at any rate, that is something that actually does happen, but it only seems to happen in some groups of truffles. It's not a universal thing to have okay. that brulee. So that's really a, a more specific thing having to do with certain species of truffles. I would say when you go more generally, if you're not lucky enough to be with a truffle dog, which usually I'm not, yeah. <laughs> uh, then you have to use other cues. If you're in North America, you can look for digs from animals. So okay. Oftentimes you'll see a place where, you know, there's a little spot where a squirrel has been digging. And if you go and you look in that hole and you sort of re-excavate a little bit around the hole where the squirrel or other small mammal was digging, sometimes you will find some truffles that were left behind by the animal. Like it dug in, the one at the top was really ready and ripe and tasty. So it took that one and then you'll find some other ones nearby. So I'd say that oh. that's one indicator that you can use. Sometimes that helps, sometimes it doesn't. But then also you just have to sort of Sometimes you'll see places where animals have dug them up and they're still up on the soil. It's hard to see that, but you do see it sometimes. But then if you don't find it with either of those methods, then you have to sort of carefully remove the leaf litter. And it usually, 
what you'll do is you'll find trouble sort of right at the interface between the leaf litter and the mineral soil. Okay. So if you sort of carefully, you know, you don't want to disturb the forest, but right. if you just look carefully in a little teeny patch, move the move the leaf litter, and you'll sometimes see those truffles just peeking up, sitting right on top of the soil, or partway in the soil, partway out of the soil. All right, I've been taking copious notes because I want to know exactly <laughs> how we can find these things in the wild. But you did kind of drop a bombshell there about the endophytic potentials. of, yeah. and, and you have to wonder, too, are they just using those roots as maybe habitat? Is that enough? You know, some propagule can be in those roots and then reestablish if something happens to the area. Yes, um, no, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, that's a relatively new finding. And so I would say... Wow, that totally blows it wide open. Where, what else are they doing that we don't know? I mean, for example, you know, for a long time, it wasn't clear whether truffles actually had sex or didn't have sex, whether the production of the fruiting body came from one individual that could have basically selfing with itself or if it had to have an external partner. Right. And we now know that it needs an external partner. And so when they've done oh. these studies of truffle groves, where they look at all the individuals genetically, you have individuals that you can follow because they're well colonized on the roots of the trees. But then you have spores coming in or new individuals that are doing the fertilization of the truffles. And we don't really know where they're coming from. They're not ones that are nearby in the truffle orchard when you type all the individuals. So there's just so many things that we really don't get about how this, how these fungi work. But that again, makes it exciting. So. Yeah. Well, and you have to wonder, yeah, it sounds like their only vector of spread is through disturbance with some animal eating them and that would seem to limit are there other ways that that genetics can flow so we think that it's probably spores are the probably the number one way that in that case truffles are fertilizing each other you know yeah that a spore is coming in with an animal right but i i will point out that at least in this group peas isales there is also some evidence that some of them make asexual spores just on the surface of the soil oh wow so there's a researcher in my group named Dr. Roseanne Healy, and she's worked a lot on these, these asexual forms of some of the truffle-like fungi. And we wrote a paper a couple of years ago showing that these asexual forms were actually much more common than had been previously documented. They've been found in a bunch of different groups of truffle-like fungi. And sometimes they're you know just basically a little teeny crust right on the soil which suggests to me that they're easily missed. And so there could be more of that going on that we haven't really documented. You know, yeah. these are things that are really cryptic, right? It's like a little white film that's created on soil. It's not very easy to figure out which fungus is, is doing that. Um, and luckily we were able to use molecular methods to show for sure which fungi were doing that. But, but it's also easy to miss them, even if you're looking for them. Yeah, and this gets to this idea of and I know we've talked about a couple of huge ones, but what are some of the burning questions that you still have on your radar when it comes to truffles? I mean, what are the, and, and maybe you just have to pick out a couple, what are the big questions when it comes to truffles that really you think are critical to be answered to really understand these? Well, I would say the number one, if I had to come up with just one burning yeah. question, it would be how many times have truffles evolved in fungi? Mm. Because we know it's, it's hundreds of times for sure, but we don't know how many hundreds of times. I wish I had a number. I have students always asking me that. I guess a lot of my questions, my burning questions are inspired by students and they ask me and I have to pull a number totally out of a hat and sort of say, this is my guess, but I don't really know. That's one that I, I hope that by the end of my career that I could at least have some ballpark estimate that I would feel was right in terms of how many times truffles have evolved in different groups. I suspect in, it's definitely in the many hundreds, but I, I don't know how many. And that waterfalls into that question of what makes those mushrooms or the mushrooms that eventually choose that strategy of turning into a truffle, that mutation, what's unique about those? Is this something inherits all mushrooms? Yeah, that's that's a really fascinating yeah, exactly. question. When you well, I think to... it's like many things where probably they're getting to that place, they're getting to that sort of lifestyle by many different roads and they do many different things. So probably we won't be able to come up with like one unified answer, but there's probably some patterns, some themes of how they're getting to that and why. And I, I have some ideas, but I don't have really good answers yet. 
I just thought of the unified theory of truffles. Maybe that's the goal, the unified theory. <laughs> oh, of I truffles. like that. I, I can tell I'm going to dream about that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's really fascinating. And, you know, it kind of leads me into this whole bigger realm of ECM fungi, which is obviously a huge topic, but you've done some work just examining the broader lifestyles of ECM fungi and what they tell us. Most interesting to me was about biogeography. And there's you're great. There's some great biogeography stories in, in actomycorrhizal fungi. I guess what are some of those stories? Because I think we've covered ECM fungi a lot on the program about you know the trees that they associate with and their role and the mysteries surrounding that role and exactly what they're doing in the forest, how nutrients and signals are potentially being transmitted. We don't quite understand those mechanisms, but in your work, you seem to have a lot about the biogeography. So what are we learning about? maybe the geographic history of the planet based on where these different populations of fungi are showing up. Sure. Well, what's really cool is that they really follow this sort of signature biogeography patterns that we see in plants and animals. And hmm. it's what you would expect from a group of fungi that are eukaryotic, right? They're, they're just like plants and animals. They're just, in, they're another kingdom. They're, you know, fungi often get called microbes and that's fine. They're microbial but they're really not microbes like bacteria. They have a lot more in common with animals, especially because they're the sister group of animals. Yeah. And so you'd expect them to mostly follow patterns that these other organisms also follow. There are some fungi that don't follow those patterns because they're, they make lots and lots of spores and they can grow on a wide variety of surfaces. So like some of the molds that just seem to be almost universal they're really ev really are almost everywhere yeah there are some fungi that follow that pattern but for the most part fungi follow patterns you have from plants and animals where they're dispersal limited right they can only go so far so even though they have microscopic spores they have a specific niche that they fill and for ectomycorrhizal fungi that is that niche is often constrained by the host plant so sure. we've done a lot of work in southern south america and in Southern South America, the only ectomycorrhizal plants that are really dominating the forest and that are native to those habitats are all in one family. They're called uh, the Nothophagaceae or the Southern beach family. And that family of plants has a really interesting distribution. It's found in Southern South America, and then it's found in Australia and New Zealand, and just a little bit into the Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea and other areas just north of Australia. And the interesting thing is you find lots and lots of fossils from that group of plants in Antarctica. So this wow. is a group of plants that, that when Antarctica and Australia and, and all this Southern continent, right? Gondwana was fused together. They were covering vast areas. Basically all of Antarctica was covered by one big Nothophagaceae forest. And those ectomycorrhizal fungi were there with the Nothophagaceae because you find evidence of that in the fact that you find related fungi in New Zealand and in Tasmania and in Southern Australia and then Chile and Argentina, which to me is just so cool. I mean, yeah. it's what you'd expect really, but it, but it is cool to see it. And so we've sort of in my lab, we've worked on some of the fungi, especially the systematics of some of the fungi from those environments. The other thing that's also I find really interesting because those habitats were really separated from other ectomycorrhizal plants in the northern hemisphere. Right. So you have some unique groups that are only in that in those southern sort of Gondwana relics places. Right. And the other thing that's really cool is because especially in southern South America, there were not there are different mammals and there's not as many ground. The diversity and abundance of ground dwelling mammals is lower. So we have some preliminary evidence to suggest that there's other groups of organisms that are dispersing truffles. So in, in the case of Chile and Argentina, there's some ground dwelling birds that seem to be playing a role that otherwise might be filled in the northern hemisphere by mammals. And there's also been some evidence of similar patterns in Australia and in New Zealand, where certainly in New Zealand, there were no ground dwelling mammals at all. We now have many of the birds that were ground dwelling birds there have been eliminated they've been extirpated and they're extinct right but there's some evidence to suggest that birds were really important for dispersing the, the truffle like fungi there as well i mean all this information is so interesting inherently but then when you think of it 
piecing together this picture of what the earth might have looked like. Yeah. I always love that idea. You're kind of like this detective seeing this population's here. Wow, this is like this population here. And when you bring them together, it kind of builds this story about what the planet looked like. And is there any surprise, I guess, to finding truffles in some of these areas? Because I think the general rule of thumb is when you keep going further south, the only thing that breaks the kind of latitudinal rule you know, going further south equals more diversity is ECM fungi, which are thought to be more diverse in the northern hemisphere. So is there any surprise about finding truffles in certain areas where you do in the southern hemisphere? I would say in general, that pattern that you're describing does seem to hold most places. But I would say that what we find is for ectomycorrhizal fungi, they're highly dependent on the host plants. Right. So for example, in the tropics, we have several different regions of the tropics that are differentiated by having different groups of host plants in them. For example, I don't know how much your readers will be familiar or your listeners will be familiar with all these different groups of plants, but there's there's leguminous ectomycorrhizal trees, which I'm sure Terry Hinkle probably talked about extensively. Yep. yep. So those occur in Africa and also in South America, but they but for the most part don't occur in tropical Oceania, and they don't occur in tropical Asia, or if they're there, they're very rare. But in those places, for example, in Southeast Asia, you have lots of dipterocarps. It's a totally different group of plants. And so some of where the plants have gone influences where the fungi have gone because they're dependent on that host plant, right? For them, the meal that they get is totally dependent on where the host plant is located. So I think sometimes talking about for example, ectomycorrhizal fungi in the tropics is a little bit is a little bit misleading because what you have is these separate tropical biomes that have some things in common, but then right. some things are totally different from each other. Climatically, they may be similar, but in terms of the actual native populations of flora, it can yes. be totally different. Totally different. Totally different evolutionary history, I guess. And the other thing is like in different environments, different parts of the world have different numbers of ectomycorrhizal plants there. So as I said, in Southern South America, it's pretty unique because it's sort of a place that's quite far away from most other ectomycorrhizal environments. And it's only one lineage of plants essentially that are the ectomycorrhizal trees there. It's interesting because there is one willow species which actually originated probably in the in the American tropics and it's made it all the way to Southern South America naturally which I think is just wild also. When you go further south in Southern South America, you have some Northern hemisphere plants that are ectomycorrhizal that have made it into South America. So if you go to Colombia, for example, there's one oak species that leaped over from North America to South America and it exists naturally in certain patchy habitats in Colombia. So we infer that that was a Northern hemisphere plant that basically invaded when the continents came together Right. It invaded. To me, that's also really cool to think about that you had, you know, when you had these continents coming together, we know that, for example, the armadillos, they're southern hemisphere things that have made it into North America. And opossums are another group that have been very successful in, in making it from the south to the north. And then there's other animals that went from north to south. But the same thing happens for, for fungi and for plants. They're just not as, you know, they don't make it into the uh, storybooks, but they're still pretty cool <laughs> stories anyways. Yeah, well, and it seems like that's one of the central fascinations with your work is what uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi, specifically truffles, teach us about evolutionary history, teach us about geographical history. Is that really kind of the core of your work? And I guess how have those insights influence your perspective at just looking at the natural world and biodiversity? I know that's a pretty huge question, but... <laughs> that is a huge question. I mean, it is fascinating to me. And certainly I think for the, the stories that we have, that we tell ourselves and that are clear from the fossil record about plants and animals, they're pretty well studied. I mean, certainly we're finding out new information about where plants and animals were and how they've evolved over time. It's not like a static story, but right. we have at least the basic outline is, is very well studied. For fungi, there's really a lot still that we don't know. And so there's, for example, from Southern South America, when we went there, 
there's a genus called Rulandiella, and it's a pretty interesting one. I'm going to use it as an example because it makes these little teeny gelatinous fruiting bodies, and it's been introduced with, with eucalypts. Wherever eucalypts are grown all over the world, this mm. genus Rulandiella is almost always there. You rarely see the little gelatinous fruiting bodies because they're really small, and they don't seem to occur very often, but it also makes these big spore mats of asexual spore mats that occur all over. So that was well known. And there are several species of Rulandiella described from Australia. Well, when we started working in Southern South America, we were finding these big spore mats all over the place. And it turns out that there are two species in the genus Rulandiella that occur in Southern South America, but had not been described. There were no named species from Southern South America. So it's not really like a big surprise to find them there, but right. that's a case where you had one of them is amazingly common. It's probably one of the most common fungi in some of the forests that we visited in Chile and Argentina, but yet it didn't have a name and nobody knew that it existed. So sometimes it's really basic things that still need to be done for fungi to be able to piece together this larger picture of what happened in the past. You have to ha have a name for the fungi that are there now. And so in many cases, we just don't have that really basic stuff yet. I see it as like building a puzzle and you have to put in one piece at a time before you can really start to see the bigger picture. And so that's how I think about my career is just one interesting little puzzle piece at a time that I can contribute to that larger story. Does the study of fungal distributions like you do and fungal ecology, does that put in a piece of the story that we might not get from just studying flora and fauna? I think it will eventually. I think it's one of the big challenges for, for studying fungi is that they're so diverse. And if you go out into a place, even, you know, I've, I've lived in Florida almost 10 years and I went out this weekend, I got a couple free hours and I went out into the forest and I found some things that I've never seen before, or at least I've <laughs> never known that I saw them. I had not put a name on them. So I think the fact that someone who spends this much time obsessing about fungi can go five miles away from his house and collect just for a couple of hours and still find things that I'm not sure what to call them. That suggests that they're probably, they are indicators, but we're gonna need a lot more information before we can really use those indicators. But yeah. there's so many things that we just, maybe no one's put a name on them or maybe someone put a name on them a long time ago and we haven't been able to reconnect that really old name with the new fungus that we're finding. The sheer diversity does make it a challenge, but it's, fun challenge anyways. And I know I was asking about applied work before, but there is an applied nature to understanding natural history and yeah. understanding the history of the flora fauna and the funga. There is an inherent value there that the connections, the patterns, the things we can use it for become more apparent as we research the organism. And it, everyone I talk to, this, this theme is constant, but you've just highlighted it beautifully is that we're still such in our infancy when it comes to studying yeah. fungi that there's just still so much ground to cover but I, I will say you know with that said i mean we are in the age of discovery but the rate of discovery has been pretty amazing during the time that i've been lucky enough to study fungi when i first took mycology it was 1995 and people were doing some dna sequencing but it was really still pretty rough it took a lot of time and a lot of money you could do one sequence it could be your master's degree and and that was reasonable because it was so new. Now we're sequencing, you know, just at an amazing rate. And it really does enable you to discover a lot more because we, you know, you can't see all the fungi in soil, but when you can sequence DNA from soil, you can start to make some of the connections to figure out who's there and what they're doing. It's really helpful to have DNA sequencing. And it has really enabled a lot of new questions, I guess. I think that availability of DNA sequencing combined with the mystique and allure of mycology to so many amateurs yeah. feels like it's created this unique wave of interest and just data collection. Yes. Um, amateurs yeah. are able to sequence and contribute to this massive puzzle with their own little pieces. Yeah, that's the other thing that has really changed is citizen science is really going crazy. I mean, and it's awesome to see because you need people who are out there who are in an environment all the time looking at the fungi around them. And the more people who are out there doing that, the more we're going to find out about, you know, the more observations there are, the more rare things that only show up every once in a while. You need to have people out there looking for them or you're never going to find them. 
and there's yeah. so many to study. So we won't run out of new things to study, I think, at this point. We can't have Dr. Smith everywhere. He's got to take care of his PhD students and his lab and everything else. He can't just be out in the forest all the time. Uh, well, I wish I could be out in the forest all the time. But the other thing I think that's interesting, like, you know, citizen science, whatever you want to call it, quote unquote, mm -hmm. amateur mycology. Certainly there are some quote unquote, amateur mycologists who are amazing. I mean, they really know their organisms, whatever group that they're interested in. They've they've read a lot about them. They've collected a lot. They've looked at them a lot. And so I. I like to see a blurring between this quote unquote professional mycology and quote unquote amateur mycology because it doesn't really serve a good purpose to have a strong division. Anyone who can contribute to a field, that's to me what matters. So I think that there's lots of room for many people to contribute to mycology and that's pretty exciting as well. Yeah, I think mycology is maybe not unique, but has this really strong undercurrent from every quote unquote, you know, academic or professional scientist I talk to where they, they are not dogmatic about science. They know that science is a process that can be engaged by anyone, and they're actually excited to have more people contributing. You know, that's something that feels unique, at least, to mycology as a field, is that you know, I don't want to say every mycologist, mycology professor is a dissident, but it does seem like <laughs> they, they are ready to, to shrug off rigid orthodoxy and just keep exploring. There perhaps is something about being attracted to spending your life studying fungi that might make you more predisposed. To that. <laughs> I think that's a great way, a great way of putting it. Well, you just, I just referenced your lab. Can you tell us a little bit about the lab that you have there at University of Florida? Maybe any projects that are in the works right now? Sure. Well, the, the one that I has been on my mind a lot because I had a trip to Chile that was canceled by the COVID-19 oh, pandemic. Sure. But we have some funding from National Geographic to study some of the bird truffle associations in the Nothofagaceae forest. Yeah. And I'm pretty excited about that work. My student, Marcos Kayafa, is working on that project, and he's going to finish his PhD in about a year. And so that's really exciting. We were excited to see how things might be different in the Southern Hemisphere. Certainly, some of the groups of fungi are the same, but others are sort of the same groups that you might see in the Northern Hemisphere, but others are really different. Mm. And I think in that system, it is going to be that where mammals don't fill those niches, that birds are filling the same niche of dispersing the truffle spores. Really cool. Yeah. So I think that's pretty exciting. And so we have some experiments that we were supposed to do in March when we were supposed to go to Chile. And we're hoping that we'll be able to go before Marcos can, it will be graduating with his PhD. We're hoping to go this next spring, which is fall in Chile. So we'll see what happens, I guess, with the state of the world six yeah. months from now. But that's that would be a great thing to be able to tell you about next time. Definitely. And a kind of a neophyte question, but I mean, do birds even have a robust olfactory sense that they could find these with? So that's a really great question. One thing that got me started being interested in this in Chile and Argentina in particular, was that I noticed some of the truffles don't seem to have a very strong odor, but they do look very similar to berries that are occurring in the same environment. And so I thought to myself, why would all these truffles look like these berries? You know, you, you find them on the ground and then you find these berries and then the truffles right together. So what would be the benefit of looking like a berry that's really common in the same forest? And I think it's that these birds are potentially not very discriminatory as they're eating and they're using probably olfactory cues and visual cues together. And yeah. so I think in some cases they may be tricked a little bit into eating the truffles. In other cases, they may just be happy to eat everything they come across on the forest <laughs> floor. And that's what some of the experiments that we're going to do, hopefully, is to differentiate. Are these birds targeting the truffles specifically or, and is it a mimicry or is it really just that these birds will eat anything that's in a certain size and shape range, and they have optimized that size and shape range for that. So we don't know. That's the thing we don't know the answer to. Really fascinating work, and we'll look forward to seeing that maybe over the next six to eight months if Marcos, if everything comes together in the right way, who knows what the state of the world will be. But hopefully yeah, Marcos it's, gets it's to go down there and It's hard to make plans these days, but, but you know, we're going to try. It really is. So fingers crossed. Oh, and I should mention, just as a quick overview, you're in charge of a fungal herbarium. What does that consist of? Just briefly. 
One of my jobs here at the University of Florida is to act as the curator for our fungus collection. Officially, it belongs to the Florida Museum of Natural History, which is here on our campus at the University of Florida. So I'm the curator for that collection, and it's oh, approximately 50,000 specimens of dried. So these are dried specimens. And so it's, it's basically a, a hodgepodge of all sorts of dried fungi that have been deposited there over time. I would say historically the most important collections that we have are from a, a man named William Merle. People may have heard W.A. Merle. He was a very famous mycologist. He used to work at the New York Botanical Garden. He was the first editor of journal Mycologia, which is you know one of the one of the premier journals for sure. fungal biology. So he was the first editor, and he also was the first person who named the chestnut blight fungus. So you probably have heard of. Cryphonectria parasitica is what it's called now, which wiped out the North American chestnuts. Yeah. That fungus was introduced to New York when he was there, and he was the one who named that species. So he's pretty famous, and he's he's named lots and lots of fungi. And so he spent about 30 years at the end of his life here in Gainesville, and he described, oh, I don't know, around 700 species of Florida fungi, and most of them are from Alachua County right here near Gainesville. And so we have all of his collections from sort of the latter part of his life. And yeah. those are heavily requested. So people want to look at them because he named so many species. People want to look at those specimens to see what he called each thing, you know, to try to decipher what he was calling things. They want yeah. to look at his specimens. So that that's a lot of what our collection consists of and is most important for. And then, of course, all of the work that's going on now in our lab things that I'm collecting and things that my students are collecting and these projects that we have in South America, at least some of that material, representative material goes into there, into that. You know, it's like a fungus library. Yeah. So if you want to go back and, and look at some specimens, morphology, you can go back and check them out. Yeah, it's, it's a big honor. And I think it's part of, you know, it is one of the reasons that I got, I was lucky enough to come here and have this job is because I had worked as a in some curatorial roles and worked at Herbaria before. So it's a great part of my job. I feel really lucky to be able to work on this fungus collection. And it's just such an amazing concept, you know, a fungal library. Is it something that the public has access to both in, you know, maybe submission of samples and reviewing samples through some kind of request process or something? So separately from that, we yeah. do identification of specimens. So it's sort okay. of a separate process that doesn't have to do with the herbarium. So the herbarium itself is open sort of on a case by case basis. I, sure. I definitely have given tours. I would say it, it's special kinds of people who want to come and see a room filled with <laughs> dried fungi. You know, there are certainly some things to look at, but the best things to look at are mostly under the microscope. So I would say only certain kinds of people want the full tour. Um, some people are happy to just hear about it. <laughs> And then as a separate part of my job, I work through the University of Florida IFAS Extension. So IFAS is the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. So we're in the Agriculture College and we have a large extension service here in Florida. So one, another one of my jobs is to identify fungi for people who need it. And a lot of times those referrals come through extension agents where a homeowner will have a question about a fungus. Sure. It might be they have a wood decay fungus in their tree and they want to know how dangerous that is, especially with hurricane season coming, yeah. you know, they want to know, or maybe their dog or their kid ate a mushroom and they want to know what it is. So I collaborate with the poison control and all these other state actors to try to help people identify their fungi and also solve their fungal related problems. People have all sorts of fungal related problems and, but especially poisonings or potential poisonings. I do a lot of identification for those. It's, so it's a variety of different things, but when people really need to know what the fungus is, there's not that many places to go for that information. Right. Uh, so I like it that I can help people. With that. Absolutely. Well, you sound like the fungus expert that Florida needs. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, well, I try. It's hard. There's so many species. It's, it's a humid hot place. So as you might imagine, I get to see things all the time that are new for me, but fun because I get to learn and I get to help other people. So I feel lucky about that. 
great responsibility, but I'm sure a lot of fun that you've taken on there. Where can people find out more about you? All this different work we've referenced, the herbarium, the lab, your research papers, where's the best place people can go to find out more about your work? Sure. I am a professor in the Department of Plant Pathology at the University of Florida. So if you go to our departmental website, you can find the faculty page. And I have a website that's easily found on that faculty page. And then if you look through, there's a whole section of my website that's all about sort of the services that we offer. There's a little informational sheet about how, if you're going to send specimens or you're going to ask me to help you with identification, some things that you might want to know. Right. And also on our website there, there's like a mushroom fact sheet page. So what we've done is some of my students and I, we make these extension outreach documents on some of the more common fungi that we have here in Florida. So for example, I get a lot of questions about stink horns because <laughs> they're pretty common in Florida and they're really stinky in people's yards and they want to know what is this alien creature they stand out. over my mulch pile. So we have one there and if, and if someone emails me and they want to know about, they send me a picture of a stink horn, they want to know what this weird thing is, I send them one of those extension documents because it has photos and it explains a lot about the biology of that fungus. So some of the more common questions that I get, some species, we have fact sheets on our website that people might find interesting. And, you know, it also has links showing the graduate students that are in the lab and the things that they're working on and the things that I'm working on it sort of gives an overview. I'm sure it'll, people will have more questions if they look at it, but hopefully, you know, it will get them started anyways with what we do. Your website's really well laid out, and I think it's through the University of Florida website, but you can also dig into your works on Google Scholar. And there's yes. a whole Dr. Smith fungi rabbit hole you can go down to really look at all the amazing work about truffles and everything else. You know, you've done work with some other really interesting fungi that we didn't cover on this episode. Uh, so I definitely encourage people to go check that out. But as you were talking about Florida ID sheets you guys make through the extension, I wondered if you had a recommendation for any listeners, maybe in the Southeast or specifically in Florida, if there's any recommendation for a good guide or resource that you found useful over the years. Well, I will tell you that in my class, I mostly have two books. These are the, the two go-to books that I All would right. say work really well for the Gulf Coast area. So one is Mushrooms of the Gulf Coast States, which is a relatively recent one. I highly recommend that. It's by Alan Bissett, Arlene Bissett, and David Lewis. It's a very nice book that is came out last year. Oh, and that terrific. has great, yeah, great photos, and it's a really good one. And then if you're in Florida, another book that is quite helpful, although it's a little bit more outdated, um, but it still can be helpful, is Common Florida Mushrooms, this one, by James Kimbrough, who is the mycologist who used to be here in our department, and then he retired, and then I sort of loosely took over his job. He lived in Gainesville for a long time, and so especially if you're in our part of Florida, that can be quite helpful because a lot of the mushrooms that he treats in there are things that you will find here in Gainesville. But yeah, those are the two sort of field guides that I use on a regular basis. I have lots of other books. I'm lucky enough to have a, a lot of other books at my disposal, but, but if I had to have just two, I guess it would be those. And if I had to choose a third one, it would actually be Mushrooms Demystified by David Aurora because the keys are still quite helpful, even though it's been a while since he's made a new version. Right. It can be quite helpful as well. So for books, those are the ones that I recommend. Oh, a solid few books there that you've recommended that I'm sure uh, there will be people that get a lot out of those. So I always love to ask that question. Well, it's been a joy to speak with you. And I'm just going to run through a couple final thoughts that I ask all my guests. That sure. I always think get some really interesting answers. Uh, the first one is going to be nigh impossible like it is for most mushroom lovers. What is a mushroom that you love and why? And this can be for any reason, any mushroom, you might think of it just right now. It doesn't have to be a favorite, but a mushroom that you love and why? Mm, that's a very good question. Well, I'll just say tuber leonii because it's a really tasty truffle and it's something that you can find all throughout the Southeast in places where you wouldn't necessarily think to look. Mm. And uh, I think I can spend a lot more time studying it to try to understand it. So that's that's one that I really like. And when you collect a bunch of it and it's sitting in the fridge in your office, if you open the door, it just makes your whole entire office smell like truffles. So I love that. 
That's fantastic. And when I read through your work, that one stood out for some reason, just the <laughs> idea that there's the pecan truffle. What? Uh, so that's yeah. really cool. That's really cool. Um, then a broader question, what has a relationship with fun guy given to you? And that could be, you know, for some people, it's a spiritual perspective on how connected things are, or maybe just an enhanced perspective on ecology or, you know, what, what has that relationship with fun guy that you developed over decades given to you? I would say it gives me inspiration that I get to do a job where I get to learn new things all the time. And my curiosity has not decreased. It's only <laughs> increased over time. So I feel like I chose the right thing to work on for my life. I don't, I feel like I'm not going to run out of questions. And to me, that is the best thing to be able to go to work and continue to work with students and have them ask exciting questions that I don't know the answer to. And me ask questions that I could spend a lot more time working on, that is pretty great. I think I lucked out in that way and the, and the fungi gave me that. It's that old phrase, do something you love, you never work a day in your life. And it sounds like you really do love it and there's more and more stuff to always be discovering. Uh, and then to kind of go hand in hand with that, what is the lasting impact that you hope to make with your work? And this can be you know, something specific or something general, you just hope to contribute to a movement or something like that. But what is the lasting impact you hope to make with your work? I hope to make an impact in the literature, like the scientific literature. So each of these papers, I hope, will contribute to our understanding of biology of fungi. I mean, in a, in a more general sense that I, I, maybe not each individual paper on its own will be perfect or exciting, but as the body of work that it will, like I was saying, earlier, each little piece that you fill in the puzzle that I think I can contribute some of those pieces. Um, but then also, I think almost even more importantly, I hope to have an impact on the students that I interact mm -hmm. with. Because, you know, I hope that I can help them to also start to love fungi as much as I do and continue to study them. I feel like if you are a good instructor, a good teacher and a good mentor, it will help people want to continue working on some of those same things. And there are probably things that even in my lifetime probably won't get answered. So the more people who are doing it, then the better it is. So I guess that influence over students in a positive way would be my, would be my big one. One of the biggest positive impacts you could really have advancing the science and also through mentorship, advancing people's own interests and their own life outlook to then advance and build upon that science that you worked on. So it's beautiful. Really, it's yeah, a win-win. Exactly. You can't really ask for anything better than that. Well, Dr. Smith, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing with us some amazing insights. I can tell you're full of so much more information. So I hope to have you back here before too long. Uh, but thank you so much for coming on Mushroom Hour. It was an absolute pleasure to get to interview you. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. It was really fun. I enjoyed it a lot.